Hello, everyone, and welcome to This Week in Hospitality Marketing, live show number 309. I am starting alone today, which is a unique difference to our normal cadre of folks that uh, are usually in the green room with me to get started. Apologize for the uh, little Band-Aid here. Uh, I made up a great ninja story. Um, saw five, didn't see the six or something, but actually it's just going to a dermatologist and all that stuff. Hey, Mrs. Adele Gubman, how are you? Uh-oh, I don't hear you. There is no audio, Dothwith. Um, <laughs> time for technology to kick in. Um, <laughs> I, oh, I did hear a vicious rumor that Mr. Tim Peter was going to join us. My God, it is the one, the mysterious, Mr. Tim Peter. How are you, sir? I am delightful. How are you, Lauren? I am... I almost wanted to bake a cake when I saw that you were going to pop in for the first half hour. I was like, oh, first, my first God. hour, actually. <gasps> it's like Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> not, am- hey, just for the record, not that I don't appreciate Adele. Adele, don't take this. Just, you know, but Tim, you know, it, it just, it's been one of those weeks where I, because uh, we do the clubhouse thing and everything. When it's the first yeah. Thing. yeah. I am so much in a listening mode. I think. There, there we go. go. Okay. I don't know uh, why that would be the case, but apparently it is. Um, it, there was being put on I mute. I think it was funny that you said you were, it, I think it was funny. You said, I've been in listen mode. And then oh, literally yeah. all the sound cut out. <laughs> <laughs> and back to you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Except my sound cut out too. So yeah. Oh, and we've lost it down. That's bizarre. I, maybe Adele was trying to fix her audio or something because she came in without audio or anything like this. I was just no, apologizing sure. for my uh, little Band-Aid on the face. I made up a great ninja story. I'm, I'm actually trying to decide, should I go with the ninja story or a pirate theme thing? Like, arr, you know, but I don't know. I, it's me. So, you know, it's funny. I know a person. This is a this is a bizarre tangent. has nothing to do with hospitality. But I went to high school with a guy uh, uh, who was uh, from Vietnam, right? So I went to high school in the 80s. His family came over. They were they were the boat people, which of course you may remember from back mm-hmm. then. And mm-hmm. he told a story about uh, a scary story, but when we were fourteen, we thought it was the coolest thing ever of having to fend off pirates as they were sailing across the South China Sea uh, wow. to, to freedom and the like. Um, yeah, so I, I know wow. somebody who, who met actual pirates, and and apparently they're not as cool as they are in the movies. No, I don't. I don't. <laughs> don't think they'd be the cool ones. No, no, they definitely don't. Says Adele, let's do your audio check. You there? No, there was no audio, Adele. You are audio less today. You're going to have to do the hand, the, the puppet thing. Again. Maybe uh, Adele. Maybe just try unplugging it and replugging it. That sometimes does the trick. Yeah. No, I'm it's sort of the, it's sort of the reboot and start over of. It's the reboot of the world. Hey, so t- t- it's just a joy. I want. How's the world been? What what is what has been on your front of your plate? What have you been looking at? What's been? What are some of your perspectives of how things are going? I mean, gosh, I got a thousand questions as to how things have been. <laughs> well, first of all, everything is wonderful. Uh, I am I am in a good boat in that most of my clients, uh, pretty much all of my clients, uh, happen to sit in markets that are doing well in chain scales that are doing well and are the types mm. of properties that are doing well. So I have some friends who work for, you know, big boxes in city centers in New York, for instance, and they're struggling, right? right. But most of my clients tend to be in uh, markets that are in demand, tend to be, you know, um, upscale or luxury properties. Um, and and uh, uh, what am I missing? And tend to be leisure oriented. So they're in the sweet spot of the kinds of properties that are actually doing very well right now. One of, mm. one of my one of my clients uh, literally is almost a million dollars ahead of 2019 and I that's not year to date. Damn. That is that is through the first 6 months they've already put um, almost a million dollars on the books above what they did in 2019. But that's awesome. but First of all, I, you know, I'm going to take a little bit of a victory lap on that for things we did during the pandemic and also have to fully recognize that that is not what we did. That is right, right. They're the right kind of property in the right kind of market. Right. You know, um, yeah. so so from my perspective, 
things are good, but I also recognize my perspective is skewed because there's yeah. all kinds of properties in all kinds of situations, right? So I'm try this. say it again. Say there, it we there we go. There we go. Hello, Adele. We got oh, Adele. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. But that that is uh, and yes, from a client's perspective. Um, I've also been very fortunate. We've lost a lot of clients that had to literally physically shut down. They were just told they, they had to shut down. Right. Uh, as, but, uh, did, as did I. I had a property, yeah. a client who I worked with for quite a long time, unfortunately, who uh, decided that the best thing to do was sell the assets. So, yeah. I mean, that's, but that was six months ago. So, I'm, I'm only looking at, you know, where we are in 2021. Yeah. And, and, and as much as we'd love to say, hey, we had a hand in it, we just like to say we had a hand in it. It's like, Correct. you know what? Right. I think right. from the combination of, Demonishing decent advice, taking on what you could do, and and really handling all the other things that we don't have an influence on, uh, they've been very, very, very uh, good at surviving and thriving in some ways. We've had clients that have thrived through the process because a lot of co competitors didn't, and uh, they uh, that opened up the space for them even farther, and they were in a position that they could continue to expand their value proposition to market. So um, it, it worked yeah. out well in that sense. And now that the market has come back to what it is, this tsunami of things in some regions, uh, it, it's only even been more exacerbated where it's like, yeah, Lauren, listen, don't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And I mean, you know, if, if I can take one very small victory lap, and I want to be really clear about this, you know, uh, so much of the properties that are doing well, who I work with is, is uh, systemic, right? It's environmental. It's nothing that we are specifically doing. What I will say uh, we did well. And when I say we, I mean the client and I, it's not just my team or not just what we do. But uh, but they all committed early on to things like we're going to be really smart about rate. We're not going to deeply discount even during the pandemic because we don't because this is not being driven by economics. This is being driven by other factors. And uh, we're going to be really smart about, you know, if we're going to do uh, any kind of discounting, it's going to be done as pure distressed inventory to pure closed user groups with a pure rationale behind it of, you know, hey, here's a loyal customer sale. You have been a very loyal customer to our us. Here's a here's something we're doing for you as a gift, which has made it easier to push rate when things came back. And so pretty much across the board, you know, they are uh, indexing above the market in terms of RevPAR because they didn't deeply discount during the pandemic and the like. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I certainly, that was something I advised them and all that was something we worked really hard on. I'm also not the one who had to pay the note every month. So it was a real leap of faith on their part to commit to that and say, nope, we're gonna, we're gonna you know, stay the course there and try to be really smart about how we message any kind of discounting we do and try to do as little as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And it did help that when they help help prove the point that when they did it, they weren't getting any benefit from it anyway, right? Uh, you know, the couple times they did it, they were like, oh, that looks just like last weekend. And we're, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't do that. So, uh, you uh, know, but I, I think it's a valuable lesson um, from, from any downturn, right? Is the reason it is hard to push rate when you come out of a downturn is because you've typically cut rates so heavily during the downturn. You know, mm -hmm. it's very hard to say we were charging you $179 and now we're going to charge you $549. That's the best marketer in the world can't sell that, no. right? <laughs> the no. best salesperson in the world cannot sell that. No. But if it's, you know, we were $349 and now we're $449, that's a much easier sell, right? That's a much easier message to get across to customers. I, I, have, a, I have a warm, fuzzy story. Uh, this is uh, friends of mine. This is not client relationship. It's friends of mine. They're in the Texas market. Um, he was retelling a story of how uh, a, a staff member of hers, his literally a, a doorman, a bellman, you know, uh, g he gives him full credit for saving the company. He, 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 he unabashedly says that this bellman saved his company. Uh, and this goes back to back in March, April when we were first getting hit with the, the first serious waves. Yep, of yep, yep. And uh, it turned out a circumstance that the exec team was meeting or talking in an open space compared to being behind a closed door. And the houseman was well doing his thing around the area. And um, 
was hearing the conversation about what do we do? How do we do this? What do we have to let people? Go? I mean, they they were blind. They were so pan- they were so as he says panic driven. Yeah, as yeah. to the crisis of what was going on, you know, the the cancellations that were happening at that moment and everything else. And <clears throat> turns out that this houseman was a former vet, and he was a former uh, uh, medical vet. You know, somebody yeah. that yeah. that you know, and uh, couldn't get a job in his field. It's a whole other story in that aspect. Uh, you know, <laughs> but was working as a houseman because that's what he could do. And uh, he interrupted them. He says, not my place, not my monkeys, not my circus kind of thing. But um, he went over and says, um, you're not treating this as a the crisis that it is. You need to pause and assess what's going on and make decisions based on what you know rather than what you're fearful of. He says, that was the first thing we learned in Afghanistan, where I would detour. That's the thing that we did whenever people were pulled into our tent, uh, was what are we really looking at? And not that he gave them advice on what to do after that point, but just that pause reset conversation literally made them go, okay, so what do we, and they, they approached it from that, okay, calm. We got past the emotional, re- and he says, yeah, I literally give the guy credit. I gave him employee of the year. I, you know, I, I've asked him to join our meetings. <laughs> So, so there is a- I love that story so much because, yeah. and I say it all the time, bring team members in when you're making decisions because you wouldn't believe what insight that they have mm-hmm. uh, to things. And you think you know everything that's going on, but they're really in the lobby every day dealing with things. They know much more than you do, mm-hmm. or at least they can complement what your thinking is and set you straight. I love that story also because it shows you that veterans have an unbelievable amount of wisdom and experience that they can bring to any business. It's a great story. It is an awesome story. It is also a, there's a framework. So he, what he just described is a framework known as the OODA loop, Hmm. which is observe, orient, decide, Act, Lauren. You undoubtedly. I just put it in the, the yeah. I saw uh, that. Thank you. The comments. Uh, you. It's a framework that I use from time to time. Actually, I, almost everything we do is built around a a, a variation of this framework. Uh, but you've undoubtedly run into this, Adele. You've probably run into this. You know, how many times have you talked to a hotel? You've talked to a client or somebody, and you said, "What's what's your problem?" Mm-hmm. And they say, "We need more people." or we need more marketing budget, or we need X. And you have to tell them, that's not a problem, that's a solution. Mm -hmm. What's your problem, right? And the first part of this is observing, what is the actual problem, right? You're making sure you understand what is it we're trying to accomplish? What is it that we really need to do before you decide how to fix it? You know, there's an old engineering phrase of a problem well-defined is half solved. And the OODA loop, which, again, I think it came from, I'm pretty sure it came from, actually, I'm looking at the Wikipedia page. It came from the Air Force, specifically. Yeah. And it's it's this military idea. And it, it's a really good way to approach things, because the first thing you want to do is simply observe, you know, take a good look at what is actually going on. And Adele, you're right. The people, the people in the front of house, the people in the back of house, the people who are interacting with guests every day are going to have a much better picture of what's going on. Then orient yourself, get your bearings, understand where you fit in that, and then you decide what you're going to do. And then you act, right? And it's a loop. It's a feedback process. So it is a great story, Lauren. No, it just came to me this past week when he was sharing stuff because we were going through. They're currently in the circumstance that I find some of my clients into is Lauren, we there's no disrespect to this, but we are just we're in logistics hell right now. We're just in the daily. Oh, sure, sure. And I think uh, I'm still hearing that too. Yeah, and 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 and, for, and so that's actually what came out of the inspiration of what I wanted to say. Uh, it's just to throw out topic of today is um, as we go through this uh, wave. I, I, I we've been thrown around tsunami, whatever demand, just demand to market. <laughs> um, you know, is there a second wave to this? Because what we're seeing and what I'm hearing, and and I might personally, you know, I never try to settle myself, but I see how I try to buy things. I'm not intentionally traveling right now, even though I have a love to think that I want to, just so because the stories that I'm hearing and the costs that I'm seeing and the 
the clamor to the people, you know, one of the reasons why I think MetaSearch is doing so strongly as a channel right now is because people, people are just looking for, we better buy it or it's not going to be there. You know, yeah. it's not a matter of rate, like, okay, that's a good rate or not a good rate. It's if I don't buy it, somebody else is going to because I'm not the only one thinking like this. And if you ever have the doubt that you're creative minded, just be in a crisis like a hurricane or something and think that you are doing something that nobody else is doing. And you'll find out that you are one of many people doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, look, we'll take this road. Nobody's been on down this road before to get out of town. And it's like, where's all this traffic from? So you, you find out that you're not as unique as you think you are. <laughs> but being said to that, I think that uh, for those who can or have the tolerance of being able to wait a little bit longer, thinking that things will settle to a more common level, because I think also our culture for the first time is faced with a limited supply of something or limited supply of things. Uh, we, we, we've been always been in the culture of there's always enough whenever I want it. Sure, sure. And, and now we're faced with the fact that, no, there's times where there's just nothing on the shelf and there's no rooms available and what have you. And, and I may give some examples from past times about that. But um, the, the idea of this is now into this frenzy. I mean, we see it in the house, housing market. We're seeing news stories now, people buying homes with that are waiving inspections and then finding out they have raccoons in the thing or whatever. Uh, and, Ra and, and raccoons, by the way, would be a step up from what some of these non-inspected <laughs> houses are finding. Yeah, yeah. Good point on that, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're in that market. Number just is there might be a, a, do you think there could be a second wave? I mean, I know there's always the unpredictability. Uh, I just saw a news pop up that, you know, some hospitals in certain markets, again, are, are code, you know, giving code blacks that they're getting such a surge of, of, uh, of cases now again that they're creating the self isolation program internally and they're doing a, who the hell is that? Hello. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, sir. This is a private conversation. <laughs> Hello. Oh my God! This is like Christmas twice. Tim, Ed, Adele. Look, we did something good in our future life. <laughs> Oh, goodness. But anyway, I just, I think, first off, kudos to you. You called it even a year ago plus, actually over a year ago, that whatever happens, future tense will be a regionally affected methodology. I don't, to your point you made a long time ago, Tim, you said that, you know, uh, we probably never go into a full national lockdown and, and, and barring any sort of uh, epic tragedy, but that it would be a regional impact in the future tense, that there would be this regional flux that would go on. And it's already beginning to show signs of like that. There are already places that are beginning to identify as, oh, maybe if you have a choice not to go here, go there instead, kind of thing. Yeah. But anyway, well, I'm just and I appreciate I appreciate the kudos on that. I want to be very clear. I, I like talking about frameworks a lot because it's a lot of what I do, right? But my framework on things like that, I didn't I didn't predict that. I simply was willing to bet that that was the most likely scenario. Not not that I knew that was for sure the thing. You know, uh, there's a great book called Thinking in Bets that I recommend to people all the time, uh, written by a professional poker player. And it basically is a great way to think about things. Game out a couple of different scenarios and say, how much would you be willing to bet on scenario A versus scenario B versus scenario mm. C versus scenario D? So I didn't predict anything. I simply was mostly w more willing to bet that that was the likeliest outcome than anything else, right? Um, and And... That was based on. That's how it tends to work every other time this happens. With, well, it's not just with, that. with any it's, kind of downturn, right? It's it's how our federal government is structured. Correct, correct. So it, it would take a change of the structure of the federal government in order to do anything beyond uh, regional. Right, mm. right. That's right. That's absolutely right. And also the way our industry tends to work. I mean, historically. If, if you ignore the pandemic, which I can't believe I'm saying that right now, <laughs> and you ignore, and if you ignore 2009, every downturn in the history of this industry has been regional, right? How many times, yep. how many times have you been in a scenario where, you know, you go to a trade show, you go to a conference and, you know, you're talking to people from Boston and they're talking about how things are awful. And you talk to people in New York and they talk about how it's amazing. And you talk to people in Vegas and they say it's amazing. And you talk to people in Houston and they say it's awful. That is the norm always. So when in doubt, assume your average. When in doubt, <laughs> assume it's going to go back to the norm. So, you know, it wasn't, and I wasn't 100% sure on that by any stretch. But I was but he was willing, willing to bet. To bet. <laughs> but, I was, but I was willing to bet. If I was going to bet somewhere, that's the thing I would have bet on most. 
you know. What's the name of the book again? I'm going to write it down in the notes. Uh, Adele Thinking in Bets. Thinking, Thinking in Bets. Bets. Okay. Oh, that's what. That, okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one last thing on that topic, really quick, and then I'll shut up and you know, oh, ask somebody else fun. a question. But uh, um, the the thing that I thought was smart about the book specifically is, you know, uh, the, the woman who wrote it said that, um, you know, business people often like to talk about business as a chess game. And she said chess is a terrible metaphor for business because chess, you can see all the pieces. You can see the whole board. You're operating with the same information that your competition is. Everybody knows everything that's going on in the game all of the time. And that's not remotely what business is like. Poker is a much better game as a metaphor because you can only see the cards you have. You don't know the next card that's going to be dealt. You can't see the cards your opponent has. You, you, know, you might be able to infer certain things by their actions, but you're making decisions with imperfect information. Mm. And you have to decide, how much am I willing to bet on this? And it's just a really, again, useful framework for thinking about this. As we look at so I'm going to turn this back into your, your statement a moment ago, Lauren, or, or the conversation you teed up. You know, as we think about where are we going to be three months from now, where are we going to be six months from now, I wouldn't be predicting we're going to be anywhere. I would be saying, what's the likelihood we're going to be in this scenario? What's the likelihood we're going to be in this scenario? What's the likelihood we're going to be in this scenario? And how much am I willing to bet on those different scenarios being true? And that should be able to guide you into... You know, where am I where am I putting my chips? Where am I putting my resources? Where am I putting my efforts to get us to the right place? And so the question I would have is, you know, if we look three months out, if we look six months out, what are the scenarios that we think are more likely than not, not what's gonna happen, right? Mm -hmm. So I want to mm -hmm. poke a hole in the poker thing. Please. Because <laughs> <laughs> I personally I can't understand. stand playing poker. And I realize the reason I can't stand playing it is you don't play every hand. Right, right. And you tend to only play hands you're forced to play. And that's not business. No, of course. <laughs> That's where analogies break down. Ed. And this is why I always like blackjack, because blackjack, you play every hand, but then blackjack's an imperfect as well, because you're not playing against someone with others. I guess you could do blackjack. Yeah, you could use blackjack. The house would be your competitor, but then you're always losing. Or, so. or, the, or the people at the table. No, because with you, the people at the table, you, you win or lose together, or you can win or lose independently, but unless you make a mistake you're really not having much outcome on the others at the table. Ed is illustrating right now, by the way, why I don't gamble very much. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, I, I, I like your black analogy a little bit better. And you are playing against house because the house does have always the odds of, when you look at the, the aspect of everything you don't know, the house doesn't know it as well, but they have the odds of success because you're playing against the fact that they will always be the upper hand <laughs> so so of. never get into a business where you're playing against a six deck auto shuffling shoe <laughs> unless <laughs> unless you have norman who can count matches when he hits the ground uh, no just, because that no because then they then they no, throw you out of, then they throw you out of the building well but even <laughs> then it's impossible with a six deck auto shuffling shoe because as they pick up the cards and they put them back into the shoe it automatically shuffles back into the deck Oh, so, does it take the old cards? Well I didn't even know that. Than we do. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, I, I just thought there was a diminishing deck and it just auto shuffled what was still left. But you're, it's like, okay. So, Dang. Ed, if you were going to gamble on where we're going to be, you know, three months down the road, six months down the road, if you were going to talk to hotels, as I'm sure you do, about where they ought to be thinking about four or three, six months down the road, you know, what are you thinking? What, what kinds of things are you looking at? Smurf market. Because it's already showing signs of recovering far faster than anyone anticipated. Plus, if you get it wrong with the Smurf market, it, there tend to be only you know ten to fifteen room blocks, so it's not going to be financially ruinous to your profitability if you miss a demand pattern. Um, Canada marketing into Canada. Canadians generally travel January to March. They're just starting to get to a point of opening where they can travel to the U.S. That's coming. It's going to be sometime in the coming weeks to you know month or two. September is the, the, the happy spot right now that everybody seems to be in consensus of. And so Canadian travelers, I think, are going to do what U.S. travelers did, and they're going to buck their seasonal behavior 
and travel as quickly as possible. So obviously markets who are popular with Canadian travelers are going to benefit the greatest with this, but I think there is a massive opportunity for markets that don't generally see Canadian travelers to get out in front of that now and be prospecting into the minds of Canadian travelers to carry um, fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll add to it some things too. I think there's going to be a larger emphasis on length of stay opportunities. I think we're going to extend their normal travel opportunity, especially for holiday periods. And I think that they're going to look for a broader opportunity to expand what they do when they go for the purposes of holidays and so forth. If they go to Thanksgiving for family, they're going to spend longer time to spend more time. They're also going to change how they get together. And they're also going to decide if there's more things to do while they have the opportunity to be traveling, I think especially given the current expenses associated with travel. I think they're going to try to optimize their spend. Well, this is also why I think Canadian is interesting because a large amount of the Canadian travelers prefer to drive over flying and will drive quite a distance. Oh, yeah. Driving, uh, driving from Canada to Florida is the, the right of ritual for them. That is not a... Yep. The, the fly means you have to carry less stuff. And when the Canadians come down, they have right. very long length of stay. So, so this is, you know, and I've actually been giving this advice to people, is if you're concerned that... Um, you know, school returning is going to put a dent in your travel. Um, you should be prospecting into Smurf and into Canadian travel. Adele. And when they drive down, it's really worth it for them to have their own car, especially if they're staying a long state, which is what the Canadians do in Florida. But they also do. I mean, they do through the whole East Coast. Uh, actually, through the whole I was, East Coast. I've, I've sure. been talking. I've been talking about this, uh, you know, quite a bit <clears throat> in the uh, the morning clubhouse rooms. And what I'm hearing is, is like I know Canadian travel is what keeps Myrtle Beach alive, January, February, March. And what's amazing is, is it's the longest length of stays. Like I actually thought our system was broken in its tracking because we were seeing, you know, 130 day reservations. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, there's something wrong here. There's an extra number here or something, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's true. Um, but then as I've been mentioning that, and I've always known Florida, right? Florida is kind of like where they all go, but I've been mentioning it in the clubhouse rooms and I've been hearing pretty much all the destinations down the Eastern seaboard have some level of Canadian demand, um, during that, that time frame. So, and then I actually had a couple of Californians who happened to be visiting the East Coast and joined the clubhouse room in the morning, who also said in, in California, they see a lot of drive market from Canada as well. So, you know, what that says is, um, if you're not a market where Canada has been on your radar and you have a fear that you're going to have a drop in your demand, I would be investing now in getting into the hearts and minds of the Canadian traveler that's within a three day drive from you. I mean, it, it like really that seems to be the distances that they're willing to go is about a three day drive. Mm -hmm. I uh, completely agree, by the way, on Smurf, completely and utterly agree. Um, I've been talking about backyard and bundle pretty much since we started, you know, look for drive market look for ancillary revenues. There is this idea of the second wallet, right? Of people spending money when they come into market that they allocated separately, both really and mentally from what they spent on the trip. So try to get as much a share in the second wallet as you can. Yeah. And, and then the last one, and this is very tactical. I, I hadn't thought of Canada, honestly. I, that's a great point. Um, what I have been encouraging folks to do, and this is very, very tactical, but use your analytics tool, whether you're using Google Analytics or something else, go into Google Analytics and look at organic traffic. I don't mean organic search. I mean non-paid traffic and the, the geolocation of where that traffic is coming from and then spend into those markets, geotarget media into those markets. We are finding for most people I'm working with, they're still getting a lot of drive market, but you're seeing a, little, a few mm -hmm. pockets of People are flying from California. People are flying from Texas, wherever. Mm -hmm. So look to see where those markets are for you and then allocate spend into those markets so you can get a better share there. You know, be really tight in terms of how you geotarget your marketing still, but let the data of where you're seeing people already showing up on your site guide you to where you want to actually, you know, double down. 
So, uh, but Smurf absolutely agrees. Second wallet for sure. And then, you know, target like a son of a gun geographically. Uh, it's small semi-sharp knife of something we've done, which proved to be really great, but it's still a blunt instrument in some ways is because we had some <laughs> contrast and lift compared to what had been existing in COVID versus what seems to be growing now, we almost created a self-made benchmark of nada and summer. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we did was it, exactly to your point, Tim, uh, for people we had around an airport up in the Midwest, uh, we, we were all drive market driven. We were monitoring and, and testing out our ad campaigns for uh, and, you know, other destination stuff because of whether there were airport hotels and so forth, just to see if there was some feed market. But we were keeping an eye via the APIs <clears throat> on flight lift. Oh, and for then, sure. And as we were watching, we started seeing the lift schedules go in from other hubs. Now, this is the, 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 the that's the sharp side of it. The dull side was feeder hubs aren't markets, they're hubs. <laughs> so it's not like the right, market right. itself isn't where you're getting the business, but through it, because the search was connected to where they're at, to where they need to get through, at least it was a blunt enough that by targeting that market marketing wise, we were able to capture some of that traffic influence from it as they were planning their trip to eventually to come to the, the market that we were most interested in coming to. And it proved to be beneficial. Again, that you know, there was a sharp aspect of, oh, let's follow the the, the flights, but the blunt was, yeah, but it kind of like blind pig finds a turnip. It's like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they came through the feeder hub. And so now we're trying to determine from the guest engagement, the refinement of the feeder markets to the hubs that we were initially targeting yeah. to see if we could f put a sharper point to the pencil on it. But it was just kind of those, and we did pretty good in comparison. And again, blunt instrument side, we we're only affecting what we already had as demand cycle weekends. So it wasn't as if, we expanded anything or improved anything, but we we were able to optimize at least the business traffic that was coming into market a little bit ahead of our comp set. You can track, I mean, it, this is imperfect, right? Because it's, it's. I'm a big believer in leading indicators, not, not trailing indicators. And this is a trailing indicator. This is a pure trailing indicator. But, you know, run a report uh, once a week, once every two weeks on what were the what were the uh, feeder markets that the people who stayed with you came from? So that can be a way to get to the other side of those hubs. Uh, mm -hmm. Or it's not perfect. It is a trailing no, no, it's great suggestion. It it's really a is. trailing indicator. So it's not like guaranteed that just because you got a bunch of stuff from California last month <laughs> doesn't mean yeah. there's demand coming. But you from can there imply, now. you can do implied metric to it that if they had but a you can do some implied metric. You could say yep. there might be another cause after. Yes, yes, yes. You got it. You got it. No, so it's I mean, that's, that would be thing. how I would look at that. It's not perfect, but it's you know the what's the old joke? The old line, you know, uh, all models are wrong. Some are useful. Right? <laughs> like this. <laughs> that's a good mantra. I have a actually. question. Uh, I'm constantly hearing people talk about the travelers changing expectations as a way of explaining the incredible number of complaints. And, you know, I mean, there's got to be truth to something with all these fights, uh, road rage, airport fights, hotel lobby fights, so many different things. But is it really that their expectations have changed so much or is what we're delivering still changed because of COVID, even though it doesn't need to be anymore? Is there, they're just expecting things to be the way it was and we haven't gone back to it. I, you know, I can only speak for the markets and the, the properties I deal with. And I, I have to say, generally speaking, we haven't seen much of it. Um, so I, I don't know that I have a lot of information on that. I, I see the news stories. I hear the stories everywhere, as you do. But in the properties that I'm working with, we haven't really seen a lot of that, you know. Um, they if are they're smart enough to be talking to you. They're smart enough to. Be well, I mean, you. that's very kind of you. I, I, <laughs> I, I think it's, I think it's the other way around. I think they are, I think they are very good operators to start with, and so you know they're very good at accommodating guests. I, I, but I'm not hearing that we're running into a lot of problems with that personally. I now that may be a an outlier. I want to be really fair, uh, but I personally don't have any experience with that. Lauren, that is, do you have that uh, is good. 
No, I mean, we, we, the same story, same news, same things. We, we, uh, uh, it, it's kind of a mix because the clients that I have are those that thrived through COVID. So they were, uh, they never lowered their service profiles. They never lowered their capabilities beyond, you know, and they never went past their ability to, to do what they did. And then the other clients that I have, and I'm not being derogatory in any way, but they, they are providing service. Uh, their functionality is their form foremost push, and and it's not a destination resort relationship. It's not a, a, a leisure pure enjoyment. It was a functionality of the fact that they're providing accommodations and location, and it was it was to that end. Um, that being said, I, I, I think they, they they struggle based on uh, their their labor. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little biased. I have a, one company I work with that I've got totally impressed with. Uh, and, and I'm trying to help them as a mar and as a management company to go into the market and say, guys, you are really good at what you're doing. You really are terrible at selling yourself. <laughs> because these guys, when it came time, because they made it that their hotels that they operate are within driving distance of their corporate office, these guys were pulling front desk shifts. They put their money where their mouth was. When they said that they were supporting the properties, they pulled front desk shifts. They cleaned beds. They did whatever they could do to support those hotels. And I know of a lot of companies that are like, well, Bob, it's 5 o'clock. Let's go home. I hope those guys can figure out those. <laughs> you know, it, it, the fact that they are that committed to the relationship that they have with their hotels, I'm like, guys, that is that should be plastered over your wall, okay, and sent out to people that you are those kind of people. So – they didn't have what you're talking about, Adele, in the sense that they never let the hotels go below that line of we don't care or we're burnt out. We don't have, pro you know, they still are struggling with getting people and qualified people, which I'd love to talk about methodologies today because the, the, the job market search programs out there right now are is a whole different beast out there right now yeah, as to how yeah. people find uh, places and so far. I'd love to talk about it in some way, but they're struggling through all of that. But they're kind of an anonymous entity because they're not. They're another man, you know. Look at a list of management companies. Sure, they're somewhere in there. You know, it's not. Well, but and I mean, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I mean no. that is historically. I've I've been in the industry for what twenty two years, and with no disrespect to management companies, historically that's not what they did. They don't right. know how to sell themselves. That's not their role in the in the ecosystem at all. Right? Uh, right. So yeah, they do tend to be bad at it because. That's not what they do. They rely on the brand, or they rely on you know a, a, they hire a marketing agency or things along those lines if they're an owner operator. But they are they manage the property. That's their role. Yeah, I I think it's going to be interesting to watch. I I don't know that we're going to see a fundamental shift. Um, this is one of my small bets. But if you look at you know some of the people out there uh, and some of the things they're doing. Uh, we may see some disruption of the way the ecosystem works, where some of the management companies may get more into becoming a brand and things along mm. those lines, where some of the brands may, you know, decide that some of the management things aren't necessarily where they're doing well and they want to just focus on where, where they can. I'm not committed to that by any stretch. That's not a bold prediction that this will happen. I would be surprised if five years from now we look at the, you know, the, the, um, universe of existing management companies. We look at the existing universe of brands and the like, and they all look exactly the same, not just by name, but also by the services that they're providing to mm -hmm. the industry and to guests more broadly. You know, yeah. um, I wouldn't bet big money on it, but I would be surprised if it if we didn't see some shakeup in there a little bit. You know, I, I I agree. I think that, and I think also emerging from all of this right now, everybody's making hay. So it's not right. really, you know, as we, but, but the same goes with all rev with revenue, all all uh, all problems are forgiven. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah, but I think uh, that a lot of hotel owners will have a hard look at what happened through COVID as as during the time frame of downtimes, and then how it was handled as it was emerging and then how it was handled post afterwards. Right. And I think the real test of metal will be when we get, whenever this is back to the competitive market of, of, of yesteryear, <laughs> where we uh, have to evaluate ourselves in comparison to our peers into performances where we're, uh, we are back to competing with other destinations. We're back to competing with people in our comp set and not just taking business because there's so much business to take.
uh, in that sense. I think at that point, there might be a hard evaluation of ownership going. So are we with the best trainer of our horse? You know, Correct. Right. Right. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Lauren. Yeah. I'm not sure if everybody's making hay. I, oh, I, no, I, definitely no, 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 oh, no, no, definitely not. Oh, no, definitely not. No, 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 I never, no, no, not on that. No, there, there's still lots of uh, gap points, but uh, uh, there's a lot of places that are doing exceptionally well. I, I'm, I have a bit of a bias because Florida in general is just, you can call your price <laughs> anytime you want. And well, you say that, except not Orlando. Not Orlando, right? It it depends. It, so there was there was actually good data about this the other day, and I'm looking for it right now, and I will post it. In the, well, uh, you were looking for it. We'll talk about what's interesting from a dynamic there, which is Orlando has started to pick up and improve, and a lot of that is coming from be people being priced out of the the beaches. Mm. Right. So right. Orlando is actually a a better deal. Is an overflow destination. Yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. it's benefiting from you know the secondary what's normally a secondary market this time of year, mm -hmm. uh, uh, being full, and Orlando is the one that's getting the uh, the overflow. But it's still, I mean, and and uh, a lot of the urban destinations, it's a it's a similar thing. I will say, I've seen consistently. It appears like everyone is making their weekends. Um, even in these urban markets, right. a lot of the feedback I'm getting is, hey, yeah, we're great on the weekends, but the floor completely falls out uh, for weekday. Yeah, and um, I can, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, all I was gonna say was I can't find the exact data right at the moment, but what I recall, don't quote me on this uh, precisely, but basically depends on markets. The big city centers that were usually accustomed as being you know, huge, New York, LA, et cetera, still struggling and especially properties above 300 rooms. You know, you get yep. into the bigger properties, that's where people are having lots of problems. So not everybody's making hay by any stretch. Um, it's just that where people are making money, they're making stupid amounts of money right now. Where they're not I, making money, they're, they're still there, not making money. There are multiple destinations that the lodging community has made more revenue than all of 2019 already this year i i said that at the start of the show Ed. one of my oh, clients you? one of their properties is is doing well above 2019 uh yeah. ready for the year 29 not year to date right full year, oh, year 2019, 2019 right. already accomplished uh in the six months of uh Correct. of this Correct. year uh mm -hmm. which is really interesting uh and it's happening in a lot of these nature destinations um, where, you know, most of the customers I deal with in the nature destinations are on some form of either they've already broken the record of the best year they've ever had in their history of being in business or are close. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and that's, that's an interesting dynamic too, because, uh, the thing I tend to throw back to them is great. Are you going to start pulling back a little to try and limit the damage on your reputation that you've done with these incredible price points? and being understaffed, you know, are you going to start repairing that? And the answer, all but one. I actually had one in our clubhouse room. It was a hotel that decided through this whole thing, they were going to keep their pricing where their pricing is because they did not believe their value proposition deserved to be above that. And they valued their relationship with their travelers far more than, you know, trying to scoop up an extra, you know, 100 Two hundred bucks a night uh, per room, and this was not a high end hotel either. Um, but they 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 knew what they were. They knew what their value proposition was. They did not feel good chasing the market. Uh, they felt like the better game to play was you know being uh, being what they are to their travelers and fulfilling that promise. Because that's the problem now is a lot of hotels are way over their skis on being able to fulfill the promise. Love and, that statement. They may not be saying words to promise a better experience, but they are saying it in their price point. That's exactly right. And um, we, uh, we're we fortunate that most days in our morning clubhouse, we have Amir from Longwoods in there, and he's an amazing source of consumer yeah. sentiment. And something very concerning um, about a month ago popped up in their consumer sentiment research, which is the traveler's expectation of the experience they'll have while they're on property versus how it was before. And it was something like uh, 40, 41% expected the same level of service that they would have gotten pre-pandemic. 30 something percent 
were expecting better service sure. mm -hmm. than pre-pandemic. That is a huge problem. And what's driving the majority of that expectation is price. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Interesting. Oh, so true though. So, so true. Well, I saw one the other day. I was I was doing shop, some shopping for uh, competitive research for a client of mine. And there's property in the market who, five star property and four plus star property you know but literally was priced 179 some days of the week and 599 other days of the week and i don't know how you can do that with a straight face like oh i've seen worse tim oh I i've seen a, worse I in my in life I i've seen life <laughs> i've seen worse in my life but not, no, no, I'm talking right now. I have a yeah, client of mine in it's Montana. Such a bad idea. That every day of the week, except for Saturday, they are like 200 bucks a night. Saturday night, thirty three hundred dollars. That's absurd. And That's they're true. and they're selling out on Saturday Fine. nights. But and that is then, just, then raise and raise every other night of the week to three thousand. They won't sell out, but they'll make more profit. Yeah, I mean, and you'll tell a better story. There's, right. there's, sorry, I'm going to get super academic for a second, but there's this concept. Uh, we all know the yield curve. We all know the demand curve and things like that. Anytime you talk about a price above a certain amount, you get into the category of what's called a Veblen good, which is a Veblen good is a luxury product where the yield curve works precisely the opposite of what you would predict. The price tells a story about what the experience is going to be. And if you price it too low, you've told the customer that it sucks and nobody buys it, mm -hmm. right? So one of the first things I tell clients that I work with who are in the four-star or five-star product uh, 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 scale almost always is try pushing rates higher. Take all your rates and raise them. You may lose some occupancy, but you almost certainly make it up in rev par and you almost certainly make it up in profitability. You want to test, you want to be smart about it. But saying that you're 200 bucks and $3,300, that is a nonsensical sale. Yep. That, there but is if you no want a perfect story example, you can tell about a property that makes If you want a perfect sense. example of what you're talking about, and I know you know this area because uh, you're, you're moving here, um, but uh, there's an area that's pseudo on Disney property called Bonnet Creek. Oh, sure. Oh, I know Bonnet Creek really well, actually. There are two luxury branded properties in Bonnet Creek, both yep. of which have never been able to achieve the price point of their pure branded hotels and other destinations. It's the Wyndham Grand and the Waldorf. Yeah. The Waldorf Astoria on most nights is cheaper to book than three star off property hotels. One of the reasons for that is the price gap from the lowest end Disney hotel sure, sure. to where the Waldorf has priced itself is substantial. And so anyone who's stayed in Disney before knows that the $400 a night Disney hotel is not a good hotel and right. it's not a good experience. And then you see the Waldorf running at $199 on Disney property, you immediately assume that that's also, that's a really you, poor hotel. You're telling people that it's crap. Yeah. Your so pricing is telling people that that is not a good property. JW Marriott and Four Seasons both put properties on Disney property as well. They went the opposite route. They're incredibly high priced. They get it. And, and you look at this, it's exactly what you're talking about is uh, it's a mix of that concept plus anchoring, right? Like well, of course, if you're of on course. Disney's property, you're anchored to Disney's price points. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing to be 20 bucks cheaper than the cheapest, but just understand you're going to be considered, you must be the art of animation level quality right. of hotel, right. which is a holiday in, right? Yeah. You know, the art of animation. If you've ever stayed at one, it's a holiday in with some graphics in yeah. the rooms um, where you're not being considered of the same level as the grand Floridian. Um, which has to be, I've never looked, but I have to imagine the Grand Floridian is the highest ADR hotel in, in Orlando. Yeah, I, sta I stayed at the Grand, Grand Floridian God, five or six years ago uh, for, for one night because it was the only room I could find it down. Uh, and it's an expensive room. And it was really expensive. Yeah, and it was, it was good. It was, it was good. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good it hotel. Good. All of Disney's I wouldn't have chosen it, but my group, the family, the family reunion, <laughs> yep. mom wanted it to be there, and right. it was good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not great. None of Disney's hotels are great. 
I mean, just but, understand. And they're nowhere near worth what they get for them. But it's because of everything else that they get the price they get. Um, you know, but when you look at that concept, you look at the Waldorf Astoria at Bonnet Creek, which is a great hotel, beautifully built, great restaurant. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And they struggle to get rate. Right. The Wyndham Grand, two hotels down from it, is where I stay with my family if we're going to do multiple days at Disney because you can get a king room with bunk beds for about $179 a night on peak season. Which a Wyndham Grand should not be anywhere near that price. No, point. no, and that you can tell they're anchoring themselves to the Waldorf. Yeah, and the Waldorf is not anchoring themselves correctly, and, and but it is that concept of you know for someone who doesn't know what a Waldorf Astoria is, which let's face it, most people don't most people know don't. what a Waldorf Astoria is. Right? Um, they're just looking at the price point compared to the budget. Disney right. hotels right. and it's cheaper, but it's on Disney property still. Right. And so they're screwing themselves up. Uh, and actually, interestingly enough, um, I believe they're rebranding it away from Waldorf to a new Hilton brand. Huh. Interesting. Which is not a luxury Hilton brand. Right. Wow. Um, so, but it is, it's that concept you talked about, um, is, is, you know, the way you price is going to tell some of the story, but understand that cuts both ways. If you way overprice, oh and you, for sure, and you get it, and you un and you under deliver, you got a real problem. Yeah, well, and and here's the thing, you know, uh, hotels that normally get two to three hundred dollars a night, if you move up into the eight hundred to a thousand dollar a night stratosphere, no matter what you put in any of your communications, it will not stem the expectation that someone who's paying eight hundred dollars a night for a hotel room is going to have. That's right. So true. That's absolutely correct. If I were them, instead of raising the rate so much for Saturday, I would put a long stay on it and raise the rate for that four night stay across the board. Maybe oh, I maybe. agree. I completely oh, agree. I, I agree, Adele. I, that's why I, like, it stuck out to me. And I actually called the hotel because I figured it was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> right. On I, one I, side I, or the other, right? Yeah. yeah. I figured yeah. something went awry with an automated pricing system and, and you know, it, it went over and they said no. And, and then I was just out of curiosity. I'm like, are you selling rooms? And they're like, we're selling out every Saturday night. I'm like, oh. If you're okay. selling out every Saturday night. They need a long, they, they should I never take a one so night. So many stay. different levers to pull. Yeah. So yeah. many different levers to pull. Uh, and they're pulling the wrong lever. Um, and, and it's, and we talked about this actually a lot this morning is the, the long-term negative impact of this behavior is going to be felt by hotels for a long time. Oh, yeah. The damage and the burning of reputation that you're creating by pricing the way that you're pricing. I, I almost want to encourage hotels. Listen, I get it. If you need the cash flow or something like that, then you know what you should do is package in a free night for a return stay mm -hmm. as a, as a value benefit to what they paid to come right now. Like, mm -hmm. because at three least for two, then, four for three. Absolutely. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to come stay with us and it's insane right now. And we know that these prices are insane, but people are buying them. So to make up for it, you stayed five nights. We're going to give you two free nights to use anytime between this yeah. time and this time yep. to come yep. and stay yep. with us. Yep. Yeah. And to I want to add that our best. Uh, and I want to say something back to what you had mentioned before about Smurf business and so forth. The exploitation of that market is also profound at this point as well. I have a dear friend of mine who's in with me that he's getting married this month. Uh, Tim, uh, not you, Tim, but yeah, my Tim. <laughs> you, you've been doing this for a while, buddy. <laughs> but he's getting, he's, he's getting married That's this month. That's the other family. Don't tell anybody. It's me on the other family. Hey, hey. So anyway, so he was supposed to get married last I year. I thought it was awfully awesome. big of me. <laughs> anyway, he was supposed to get married last year. They put it off to this year. Of course, the cancellation, they were, there's still fees. They, the people still held them to fees of cancellation and rebooking and so forth. And part of that was also the condition of full payment up front, no refund. Well, they went over and uh, planned it for 300 people. Beautiful place. And uh, they get the invites back and they have 50 because people it's just too expensive for people to travel it, the cost of getting yeah, there yeah. was extreme so they went back to the venue to go over and say we're we don't have the people this is going to be a hollow hall you know 
we had 50 people. We were supposed to have room for. Yeah, too bad. Okay. Oh, and Do I have an idea. Uh, elephants. Ooh, I like <laughs> elephants. Have you been watching the same shows I have? Have you seen the Indian wedding show? Oh my With the God. elephants. What the is elephants. the wedding show? <laughs> well, I don't know about this show. Yeah. Like, right it's really amazing. They spend half a million dollars on these like... beautifully like dressed elephants. Yeah. And if you're gonna oh, have cool. a huge hall and have not elephants. a lot of people I'm there. liking it. I don't know if they can grab one by now, but I, I'm sure elephants. they could be yeah. yeah. But okay. but I think the hotel at least at least ought to throw in the shovels for free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the other part with it. The hotel refuses to give them a block. Sorry. Rack rate, all you can get, there's no block. You have no block. So they go through this whole process of it. So then, leap forward, client, uh, beachfront Carolinas, um, went over and can't sell their conference room because their rate requests are almost quadruple what they used to ask for. And they can't understand why they're not getting anybody to book for their, their conference center stuff for smart business. Because it's like, guys, have you just, I understand that you feel that you can price yourself into a market of demand, but you have outpriced yourself. They're not right. getting right. people to buy stuff. And, and that's the part that I think is unfortunate is that, and I think Dean brought this up in a, a statement a couple of weeks ago on the show. He always says it went from revenge travel to revenge to, of the traveler, you know, or, you know, to, they're, we're taking revenge out on the traveler. Like, oh, you want to travel now, do you? Well, here's the price you have to pay. And and, and so it, it, some people are actually replanning. There's friends of his that are also we're going to get married are literally they canceled everything they're doing. And they're considering just to do the elope thing, and have a private party when it comes time best for them to do it and then just enjoy the money they didn't spend on going someplace to do something, you know, mentality. But so, it, so I, I hate to keep bringing up, but I mean, we have so many good conversations in the clubhouse room with different points of view. This actually led us to one of the, who we think is going to be the, uh, the midterm kind of losers of this behavior, which is going to be real estate investment trusts, because a lot of this behavior is coming from REIT owned properties sure. mm -hmm. where, you know, uh, they don't care about, your scores. They don't care about anything like, Oh, you achieved higher scores. Yeah. But your cost of labor went up. So, so yeah, you know, right, right. You, that's a, a loser. Um, and there was actually a pretty deep talk about that because I was kind of naming who I thought was going to be the winner coming out of all of this, which is uh, select service and micro resort hotels. So, you know, hotels that you're not planning to spend a huge amount of time at, yep. um, they're not getting hammered on their service mm -hmm. scores. Uh, even with getting up into higher prices, because the expectation of why stay at that hotel is to explore the area. That's right. Well, it's yeah. the area. You're exploring well, right, the right, area. Right, right. And if anything is limited in the area, they're not looking at the hotel as the one who caused that. Um, and, and, you know, so I was naming them as the winners and someone who used to work for a very large REIT owned property was like, yeah, and the losers are going to be the, the REIT owned properties because they don't care. And so they're the ones that are like, how, how many pennies can we jack this up? And who cares what the recourse is? Like low cost, high profit, that's what we want. Um, and, and, you know, it is interesting when you look at that dynamic. Um, it, it, I really do believe these simpler properties that have a simpler promise to fulfill are the ones that are going to win the hearts and minds of a lot of travelers. Oh, and, sure. and that's going to have a lasting effect for at least a couple of years. I have, I have a question. I mean, and, and this may be a naive thing to ask. I, I interpreted micro resorts differently. You refer to them as being the small, um, not destination resort, but the catalyst less, to the less expectation of services, uh, meaning yeah. you're, you know, generally a micro resort's not going to have a spa. Uh, right, right. They'll have, okay. yeah, they'll have yeah, a dining yeah. outlet. They'll have a reasonable pool, but not like an expectation of poolside service. Of the, right, and, of, the, of the zero edge and all that. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, you yeah, know, okay. so it, it is a full service hotel, but it's not big, right? It's right. a, you know, yeah. maybe two to 300 rooms total. And, okay. and usually you're in locations where the thing to do is spend most of your time not in the hotel. I sold Super 8 Travel Lodge Howard Johnson for years, and we used to talk about the Super 8. And by the way, I to this day, I will tell you, Super 8 is one of my favorite hotel brands that exists. 
because they make a very simple promise and they deliver on it consistently. And one of the things we used to say constantly, and this isn't meant as a slur, it's going to sound like we're making fun of people, we're not, but nobody stays at the, nobody went to the Super 8 to stay at the Super 8, right? right? Mm -hmm. They are going somewhere else. They are in town for some other purpose. There's other things they want to do. And what Super 8 does is a really good job of that. Yep. You're the place you stay when you're here to do other stuff. And right. I completely agree with that assessment, Ed. I think, I think but that everybody those... deserves that they get a very clean room, you know, a fresh smelling room, mm -hmm. a friendly uh, service, Adele? and well maintained. And right. Super 8's and that's tagline easier. for a long time, which was a bad tagline. It's not a great tagline, but Super 8's tagline for half the time I worked at Wyndham was clean and friendly. And that's what they were, right? Yep. Super 8 was the Southwest Airlines of, of, you know, hotels. And, I mean, I'm not trying to be delusional about this. There were, there were uh, 2,000 Super 8s, 2,200 Super 8s. Some percentage of them were not up to standard. Let's be fair, right? When, and if you're talking about 2,200 hotels and 10% aren't up to standard, that's bigger than most other chains, right? right? So there were a lot of hotels that were not great. It also meant there were 2,000 that were exactly what you needed them to be. Clean, friendly, smelled okay when you walked in the room, right? You know, maybe not the most updated, fully understood. But again, you weren't staying there to hang out in the room. You were but staying your, there but because to your point, you were Adele, taking your kids is, to Disney. I think everyone has that expectation. And with these smaller hotels, that's the primary expectation. Correct. As soon as you Correct. start getting into destination hotels, hotels with other services mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. butler rooms or spas or you know, golf, uh, or, yeah, golf or anything like that, those hotels the expectation is not clean and friendly. That is just going That's, to happen. That, the that expectation happen. is, is all of the other things right. that make this hotel expensive are why I'm here. And those all need to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, I'm blaming the hotel, even if it's not their restaurant, it's in their building. Even if it's not their spa, it's in their building. Even if it's not their golf course, it's in their building. I'm blaming them. Those are the ones that I think are having the hardest time because let's face it, just staffing your core team is really difficult right now. Now mm -hmm. imagine also having to deal with employee shortages on the golf course, employee shortages in the spa. Your barista at the coffee shop, your right. pastry pig counter person, right. all the so, other stuff you have. So yeah. this is why I, I was saying, you know, I really think the winners of this are these simpler properties. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's going to have more than a U1 2021 type of effect. I think there's a lot of people who are picking trips that are less about staying at the hotel and are picking trips that are more about exploring. And mm -hmm. I think they're being surprised by the experience they're having at these properties when they see the reviews of other properties in the area that were more expensive and more complex are getting hammered where mm -hmm. these properties are getting really good review response. Yeah, I mean, think about think about uh, Adele, and I'm, I'm gonna, this is the last thing I'm gonna say and then I'm gonna have to drop, unfortunately, but. Uh, um, you know, think about all the times you see on TripAdvisor the the three star product or the two and a half star product that gets four bubbles on TripAdvisor, and it's not because it's or five, or five. Yeah. and it's not because it's better than the five star property. It's because they do a really good job of delivering on what the value proposition is. There's no gap between the expectation or and the the delivery against that expectation. Or if there is, it's a positive. It's gap, a positive, not, gap, a negative, yeah. not a negative gap. Yeah, mm -hmm. we did we did research a long time ago, and this is well overdue for uh, an update, but I've used it for years where we referred to what people look for. The research backed this up. What guests look for, what I always call the P's and the Q's, they're looking for in some relationship to one another, price, proximity, how close am I to the things that I care about when I'm in destination, qualities, which is really just a fancy way of saying amenities so that we can actually get an extra cue in there, and quality, right? 
And when you can add those up in whatever it means for this specific trip, that defines the value proposition for me of did I get good value and will I give it a good review? The relationship between them may change. For this trip, I may be more price conscious and I care a, a less about the amenities. I care less about how close I am to things. This trip, I desperately need to be by the main gate to Disney and I'll pay any amount of money for it. But it's those are the things that define the value proposition for the guest. And I think Ed's exactly right. The, the, the properties that that have an easier time delivering on that value proposition, and especially because proximity is such a big driver right now, and you know the qualities are less of a driver, I think they're just in a really good position. Um, I, I do apologize. I do need to run, unfortunately. No, I've, do, got, do. I've got a be somewhere in 20 minutes and I need to stop Two. talking if that's going to happen. Actually, three things. Three <laughs> things. One, it is a joy to see you again, flat out. Likewise. Uh, two, I need to trace you down because personally I have questions that I need your your your, your stoic advice on about like the TV channel and blah, blah, blah. Plus, I am totally get, still in need of geeking out with you on VR, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward. I can't wait. I can't wait. I am working remotely. I am doing a workcation next week uh, from sunny Orlando, Florida. So uh, and I'll be he, gets, he gets to have lunch with me next week. What? <laughs> so I'll, I'll be sitting in a hotel room uh, some parts of the day. What happened to my invitation to come down on the boat with a case of beer? Where, where did this go? Where did this go? <laughs> you're, you're much further south than that, my friend. It's only a couple is, of hours. <laughs> this is a very short hours. trip. This is a very short trip. So, Are you looking uh, for a new home? We are looking for a new home. We're doing some work uh, and things along those lines. Yeah, but we're trying to figure out where we're going to live when we actually live there. Don't live near Ed. Don't. The neighborhood has gone to hell. <laughs> actually, to be fair, to be fair, I don't want to out Ed, but I know where Ed lives roughly, and it is much further away from proximity. It doesn't work for us specifically. Ah, right, because of where Tammy's going to work, you can't get there from where I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> so. Without traffic, it's 15 minutes. The problem with is, traffic, it's a day and a half. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, Tim, thank you so All much. Right. Um, if you want to find your Cheers. podcast and what you do, where can they find you? Timpeter.com, timpeter.com slash podcast. Look All forward right. to it. Uh, I will not see you next week. Next week I will be on a plane, but I will see you uh, hopefully the week after. All right. Awesome. Safe travel. All right. Cheers. Have fun Bye, lunch with that. <laughs> Uh, dude. So, hey, hey, since I do not make it up in the morning, Ed, as much ever, maybe once or twice when you were on BK, um, what else has been coming up on your mind? Because our afternoons have truly shifted into almost small business land. I mean, interesting. it has been really, we've been getting a, a strong cultivation of, I have this idea, or this is what I'm doing for the, or this is what I'm, I'm building. And so it's turned into a, a and a lot of restaurant stuff. I got to say, we've really, for the past couple of weeks, it seems to come up more persistently, food and beverage operations. There's a lot of quite people begin to come to the show. Well, I don't know what to call it, a show, a conversation, I don't know, a room. The room. The room that uh, is about more about restaurant stuff because we've been having the likes of Doug and Dave and people that are in the space. Right. And, they, and the Restaurant Association is coming up uh, August, isn't it, Orlando? Is, is it Orlando? Mm -hmm. I think it's Orlando. So it's kind of building up to the, okay, you know, we, we had food truck conversations. So what's going on in the morning side? So um, we've had some interesting conversations this week. Um, so Wednesday, as you know, we do destination marketing specific chat. So we actually talked about the promotion that Tennessee tourism is running. And I don't know if either of you caught this. No, 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 um, no. So they partnered with a famous country music singer and I'll get the name completely wrong, but it's like a Kenny Chesney type person. Okay. Um, who evidently wrote a song like Tennessee on me or something. So the campaign is Tennessee on me and it is a campaign targeted at their urban centers. So Nashville, Memphis, Chattanooga. Mm -hmm. um, and it's targeted at midweek stays for now till the rest of the, uh, the year that if you book a two night midweek stay, they will give you a $250 airline credit uh, to any of four participating airlines. Wow. So super targeted, tied into pop culture, culture that's meaningful to Tennessee as well. Country music's a big thing there. 
um, but also really thoughtful. And, and, and what's interesting is part of the discussion was, is there was initially some political attack on why are you feeding Nashville and Memphis and Chattanooga and not Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge? This attack was not coming from the Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge industry because they're overwhelmed mm -hmm. and they have been for been bought, almost yeah, a year. Been, yeah. Been crazy. Um, and so it, that was kind of interesting that there was an initial kind of political attack on it until everyone went because Chattanooga or because uh, Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge and the likes of those can't take anyone else. Like there's no room left at those ends. Um, but the, the urban markets weekends are back. Like, you know, Nashville's weekends are on fire, but they're still struggling on those midweek stays and they don't believe corporate travel is going to return in a meaningful enough level to, you know, trust that, you know, the fall will pick up and stuff like that. So they're running this to try and get tourism, you know, leisure tourism into these cities. So really smart targeting and they're capping it at a really high number. They're going to do 10,000 of these airline credits. Wow. That's a lot of money. Nice. Yep. Uh, they yeah. built an entire site for it. They put a booking engine on it that has all the inventory of all the hotels in those markets. Oh, like this has been thought out really um, well thought out. And it, you can tell it was thought out for a while because you can't pull that stuff off quick. No, um, no, no, no. So we talked about that on Wednesday. Then on Thursday, we talked about uh, Wyndham's announcement that they're going to start um, having Bitcoin as an option for mm -hmm. rewards on the Wyndham rewards. Um, which was really funny because the person who brought it up was really excited about it because he's really into cryptocurrency. And I said, yes, but you're not Wyndham's customer. Yeah. And this is nothing more than a talking point for shareholders to feel like Wyndham is super innovative. Um, but in the reality, uh, and I actually put a bet to him. So Tim talks about talking in bets. I put a bet to him that less than 300 people in the next five years will take a Bitcoin from their Wyndham rewards. <laughs> 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 so that then actually led to a really interesting conversation about the challenges of blockchain technology um, and how, um, you know, we, we keep forgetting that the scale of consumer adoption, it, it, like you can't hit mainstream consumerism with the current way that blockchain works. There's not enough resources in the world to serve a distributed ledger for something that would hit like an iPhone level scale um, because of just the amount of GPU resources it takes to serve up a distributed ledger is still the biggest problem. It's the biggest limiting factor. And it's actually, it is starting to creep to where that's becoming obvious because mm -hmm. some forms of use of blockchain are actually starting to hit reasonable early adopter level usage. Mm -hmm. And it's already choking. I mean, like if you've tried to buy a computer at all in the past two years, if you wanted a good graphics card, their pricing is over um, the over the outrageous. top because outrageous. the entire supply has been getting scooped up by server farms serving up distributed ledger did you see in the news the uh a power station up in uh the northeast and i can't remember whether it was it, i don't think it was connecticut but it was something like that it may have been maine even i'm not too sure so a power company shut down this power plant it was a coal burning power plant uh and because they didn't need it anymore they created different infrastructure but the building still existed mm -hmm. so a company a startup company bought the power plant and built it as a bitcoin farm oh my god and because they needed the power to run all these, I mean, they have tens of thousands of small box uh, processors yep. to farm Bitcoin and other crypto. I'm saying Bitcoin in general, but, you know, all cryptocurrencies that they were farming for this and they were expanding. And the issue came in the news because as the coal firing place got picked up, they were turning it to more uh, economical, whatever. But the discharge goes back into the lake again, which goes down the river again, maybe in Michigan. I don't know. Uh, and so people locally are like, we don't need this. We don't need no crypto stuff. And it's going to pollute this and so forth. And they had this argument about the environmental impact on this. Why do we have a green <laughs> currency, but a non-green way of producing it, blah, blah, blah. And, and the, the, the pictures that were showing on the inside, that was scary. I mean, it is just 
like a, a star. A oh, size it's like a scene from a movie. Oh, yeah. in front of, them of all these racks of computers, uh, yep. processors that are just all intercon- interconnected and so forth. I'm like, my God, the computing power and the debt. And was this just is funny. and this is the problem because also think about beyond the pollution of the power drain of that. Most GPUs contain rare earth metals. Yeah, and so rare earth metals are called rare earth metals because they're really hard to mine. And generally, mm-hmm. they're actually not rare. They're in ample supply, but they're in no concentration anywhere. Mm-hmm. So mining of rare earth metals is usually destructive to the ecosystem that it's that that it's being done in. So anything that contains rare earth metals has a huge problem on its footprint. And, you know, so if you look at like the amount of that being consumed by what is basically a useless technology, because mm. it's useless, there, no one has figured out how to do this better. Um, and again, it's because there's not a lot of money in figuring out how to do it better. Um, so, yeah. What do we need this for? Exactly. And so and when you see hotel brands like Wyndham talking about this, it's just buzz. It, no, it, it's, it's buzz to a point where you also know that they didn't think this through. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's so okay. Question going back to the Tennessee conversation. So, has there been any discussion as to how the conference center in Nashville, which was such a change in the Nashville culture, I mean, from what it was before to what it is now, ha, are they getting back to demand levels that that the conference center can fulfill, or is it still kind of a you know what we're really relying on our our Nashville roots program where it's music and destination and kind of thing are, are they getting back to where they were because they 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 changed the culture of that city, the conference center yeah i mean they're they're still not there um okay. that's still a, a long ways away um hmm. yeah yeah no and and so we we didn't we haven't really talked much about that um yeah. mainly because i mean much like orlando orlando convention center isn't doing any right thing and i imagine chicago is still struggling all the large footprint con- i mean chicago good gosh I mean, mccormick center it's just it's it's the size of it. If you ever get to see even a portion of McCormick not set up, it's amazing the size of it. And Orlando, I've seen Orlando once, their main venue where they had it all broken down and they were yet to construct Yeah, and it's just a big open space. Yeah, it's... Oh, my God, that's amazing. I mean, like, yeah. you feel like you could fly a plane in there. I mean, it's so... You could fly a helicopter in it. I believe it. Yeah, I believe it. It's 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 yeah. amazing the size of that. You think about all the things that it takes to run those places and all yep. that's kind of on a lower demand cycle right now. All right, so, another question. Okay, so, um, so, you know, and then today we talked about um, a bit more of the marketing challenge that has come up with not just the issue of filling staff, but now the media has started picking up uh, the greed of the of what's happening in hospitality where... Yep. Um, and it's been really targeted towards the major brands on yep. how they're announcing that they're not r- going to bring back services. Yep. And a lot of okay. the headlines of these have been they're cutting services, but not but not the, the price. price. And that's the media, where the anger is coming from. I think. It is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's hugely problematic and mm-hmm. um it's going to have a bit of a lasting effect. I think it's uh, there's going to be a hangover phase at some point um, where travelers are just going to sideline themselves either because they're priced out or the value proposition of what they get for what they are you know paying is not in line. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the, go ahead, Adele, go ahead. You know, I think that because a lot of times those hotels under a chain brand are owned by different people and managed by different people. Real estate it, investment trust. <clears throat> what did you say? Real estate Real investment trust. <laughs> yeah. But the ones, I mean, it's, it's, it's like the double tree hotel in Reading, Pennsylvania is one of the highest rated hotels in the entire state with a pure five bubble review score of thousands of reviews and, and, and the rest of Doubletree, you know, at a 78% guest satisfaction. And I'm sure the NPS score is much lower than that. That's because individuals who run different hotels are either living by the Hilton stated culture 
and those who are not. And mm. and that is the difference. You well, have to guess, live your guess who gets to get away with not living by that culture? The heavily mm. investment owned properties yeah. because Hilton and Marriott can't really push back strong against mm. them because they no. have so much of their portfolio. Right. Um, and, and, and and they've performed so poorly for them. They don't have any legs to stand on Hilton. And I mean, like I think what you're pointing out is the Hilton announcement that other than their premium brand levels, they've auto automatically reduced their housekeeping standards mm -hmm. of, of service levels. And I think from what we're seeing in the media coverage, again, to your point is you're getting a lot of people going, let me get this right. Um, I'm paying twice, three times as much. And you're automatically telling me before I walk in the door, I'm not going to get what I used to get for what I used to pay a third of. Yep. So, and, yeah, and, and actually, and, you just touched on the key point. And I'll wrap up here because yeah. I got to run. Yep. Um, the biggest problem for these brands is people remember what they paid in 2019 because sure. they do travel a lot with these brands, right? And so, you're actually the people who you're burning the hardest are the ones you worked and spent so much money on winning over to get them to always just default to you. Those are the ones you're hurting. And this is where I'm saying there is going to be a long tail effect. And I think mm -hmm. it's going to get to a point where it'll be like a hangover where mm -hmm. there's nothing you can do. It's going to be sluggish. You're going to be, everything you try to do is going to be like, you're trying to sprint in a pool of jello. Um, and it's all because of what's going on right now and it's avoidable and it's not being avoided. So well, with oh, that, I do have to run because I have a one o'clock. I, I did everything I could. I told you I would try to make it today. Yay! Um, so Thank you, Mr. Uh, it was really nice seeing you guys. I'm glad you're doing you. well. And, yep. uh, I hope you guys have a good weekend and I'll, I'll talk to you soon. And say hi to Tim when you have lunch with him. You got it. <laughs> All right. See ya. Hi, Mr. Ed. Uh, no, it's 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 true to your point, Al, that, that there is this anger. I mean, and it is constantly in the news. Uh, that, uh, that even just down here in Southwest Florida, in our local airport, we had uh, a young woman, a twenty-something-year-old woman, who just escalated her belligerence being on the plane, uh, trying to board, where she refused to wear a mask, and then she started spitting on people or whatever. I don't know. Just bad, 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 bad. Now she's in jail because of all of this. And then so they're interviewing people in the airport about the fact that even though over the speaker is saying, you know, it's federal law that in the airport you're supposed to wear the mask, they're interviewing people without masks. And the guy says, and they have to bleep them out. Yeah, this is bull bleep. You know, I ain't wearing no mask, whatever. And so they ask the security people at the airport, what do you do about people not wearing masks? Well, we don't pick people out of the group, but if somebody complains about them, we send them to give them this little piece of paper that to notice that they're supposed to wear a mask. Oh, that I'm sure works really well, um, you know, and so you're not enforcing it, but you're mandating it to a certain way. And the guy even at the one says this, you know, whatever he says, but I'm also going to wear a mask when, you know, he's carrying one little paper one. This is better. I'm also not going to make it so I can't get somewhere. So the point of wearing a mask is totally eluded these people. The function of having to wear a mask hasn't. OK, I have to wear a mask to get on a plane. Fine. Do I believe it? No, blah, blah, blah. I think it's a choice we have. Sure, it's a choice we have until you get sick and realize that it wasn't your choice that somebody gave it to you. How do you feel about that? Are you mad at the person that made the choice not, not, not to do what they should have done and then you end up getting sick because of it? You know, in our Sioux culture, the first thing you want to do is chase them down and go and say, hey, you gave me this to me because you're irresponsible, like a car accident. Um, another local news thing. Somebody died from somebody running a red light and they got charged with running a red light only. And people are like, how is this possible? You you ended somebody's life for breaking the law, and the only law you broke that you're being held culpable is running a red light. And they're sitting there going, how does that balance in the universe of you did something worse than just breaking a, a, a traffic law? You, you caused fatal injury. And there's not a law that does anything about that. So we have this, this you know, prid pro quo conversation back and forth of what you get versus what you deserve and so on. But we're not enforcing it to the level that we're all looking at saying, and some people are sitting back saying, oh, okay, uh, well, hey, shame on them. 99.8% of the people that are getting COVID right now don't take a vaccine. Well, you get what you take. You don't, you're missing the point of what pandemics are like. It's that variant will turn into another variant that eventually all of us that did take the vaccine don't have a vaccine that counters what now is in the, mar in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the population. That's the problem is that the more it's allowed to continue to change, the more likely it'll eventually come out that what we did for ourselves 
does affect us because it doesn't effectively cover it. And just, I think all what you're saying earlier on is penned up in what we're doing when we travel right now, where we're like, okay, I'm going to go travel. You're mad they have to pay as much as you're doing. You're getting less for doing it. And then the silliest of things will just absolutely light your candle as to how frustrated you are with, and the staff gives a full face. They, they're the ones that you know, the, the, the staff has had it up to here with the people who they're viewing those people as being, you know, over entitled, uh, argumentative. They're not reading the confirmation. They booked this type of room and they're complaining that, that, uh, that they booked a different type of room or that's not what they expected. And they, they, these guests must be idiots and all of this, they're, they're so frustrated and I feel their pain and we're not, we're not addressing our communications. We're not, we're not doing anything to help them have a reasonable expectation so that there isn't this attack at the front desk. It's not fair to the front desk people and we're not properly equipping the, the front desk people on how to solve the problems in the first place. But the worst thing is, and with what you're, what you're saying about the accidents, they're not accidents. Mm. If you're intentionally, repeatedly doing highly risky behavior that is not necessary. It, you you can make another choice. You can be more practical. Sometimes there are accidents that happen. Uh, a bee stung you while you were driving and you lost control of the vehicle and, and something happened. That's an accident. Mm -hmm. But if you ran a red light and you continually do so because you're not paying attention, you're a distracted driver, you're constantly texting. How many times do you have to be told to stop texting? You change the radio station. Uh, you are talking to your kids in the back seat, looking behind you. That is you're driving with, 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 with one, one hand. Everybody knows that these are dangerous um, things to do. And mm -hmm. not a way to be a responsible driver. And if you take somebody's life, that you it is you can't really call it an accident. Right at that point, it's 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 funny that we talked about this goes to conversations we've had and in, in, in many times I know or not in the show, but also just in general for for clubhouse rooms and so forth. Is that um, I'm struggling with trying to help uh, companies. And bless you. Popped up on blue. Uh, apologies. <laughs> Um, the um, finding teams, team members, and the traditional ways of looking for it are are, are moot in the sense that they just they're not applicable anymore. Uh, and 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 team members that are being stretched beyond their limits, it's one thing to be elastic and do that from occasion and come back to it and can do it occasion. We're the, the new benchmarks are it's a constant beyond the, the normal spectrum of, accept, of expectations. And those people, as good as they're intended and as well as they are, they're not given the resources to do what they can and or have no, even if given the total carte blanche to do what they do, they just can't keep doing enough of it. I, uh, the old adage is you can be the best warrior in the world, but you can be overtaken by 100 dumb people that don't know how to fight simply because you can be overwhelmed by the sheer volume of what you're having to deal with. And, and that's what a lot of our team members are that are great and they are multiple tasking and multiple capable and fully good people that are trying to do the right thing. But after a while of doing this so much so often for so long, their attitudes can get lost, their motivations can get lost, and they're resigned to, I can't solve it anymore. I have been crushed. Their spirit has been crushed. And, and they don't, they get into that indifference. That's the only defense they can fall back to is the defense of, I can't care anymore. You, you, we talk about these things from wartime. You know, the, 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 the Vietnam uh, veterans talked about the fact that they remember their first squad that they went into battle with, but they don't remember many of the squads afterwards because for some, they didn't want to get involved in knowing the people they were with as much because if they lived long enough, they would. If they didn't, then it is one less pain. And 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 so we're kind of dealing with that in a different way, obviously, by far, uh, with our industry when it comes to the indifference that we're creating in our good team members, where the only defense they have is to not care. Yes. Because they can't. And Stuff in the pain. Go ahead. 
None of that. I was just going to say exactly. And that's why you can't expect that somebody who has numbed their soul because it's so, so crushing to be in a place where the, the leadership are not listening and not making changes to accommodate them. And you expect those people to go out in the world and recommend this career to their friends. Yeah. How, how is that going to happen? Right. I, you know, they have, they, they're one, they're questioning their life choices already. They're mm -hmm. not going to drag people they care about into it. They're no. not going to meet somebody at Target or UPS or um, at the gas station that has a sparkling uh, personality and say, I know a great opportunity for you. They're, they, how can they do that? They might reverse the conversation and say, hey, you got another spot? I can work with you. <laughs> You're right. I mean, honestly, we're driving people away from that. Yeah, the only way to be an attractive spot for, for talent um, of any kind, the only way to get your team to be excited about inviting people that they like into this framework is to be uh the kind of hotel who's in a state of continuous improvement, who's looking how to achieve their goals and, and celebrate uh, improvements and greatness every day and, and where they feel themselves appreciated, cared for and respected as a human being. Mm -hmm. And if we just treat them, if, if, if the, if the ownership is so far away from what's happening on property, that they don't care what they think they're making decisions that are in the best interest of the revenue. But the fact is that um, well-trained, aligned teams that are empowered to, to make things better every day are making three times more revenue than their counterparts. And they are delivering 1.5 times to their shareholders and that is according to um, McKinsey and Company. Mm -hmm. It's it's true, and I guess in a strange way, it's going back to an old adage of Maslow's hierarchy that it's wonderful to be aspiration in your terminology of we want to do these things and this is our goals and so forth. But the reality of your life is you base it on what you are able to say is at the level of what you can do, and sometimes sustainability or existence and tolerance is all you can do. Because all the other things that you would like to do, like you're saying, being treated as a human being, thoughtful as to the goals that are created for the for the company and so forth, isn't being supported by the people that have the strongest influence on it. They, uh, you know, and this goes to a little bit of what I was pointing to about the the, the pursuit of other team members. A lot of people don't, um, from an HR perspective, get included in the discovery of more talent that can help them. Uh, a lot of people are, are doing the frontline work. They could have a strong influence. We pointed out in the earliest part of our conversation today um, that they should be solicited and engaged in what it is that is best that they need. As, as Tim pointed out, it's not talking about the solution. It's talking about the actual problem. What is the actual problem? The problem is I can't do this because I'm doing this at the same time. The problem is I can't be here and over there at the same time. So what is the solution requirement for that? So after you have identified the problem, as he pointed out, just talking about I can't do everything you want. Well, that's apparently the, the solution that we would like to think you could do, but we can't, we have to find the problem. And so uh, they're not being solicited to help with that. And then secondly, the people that are responsible for it aren't given the direction from the people that need to classify what that is. Like an HR person doesn't know all the things that a front desk person truly needs to in, 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 imbibe in for the role that they specifically need. A nighttime night clerk, is different than a daytime desk clerk, even a morning clerk, because you have a different propagation of conversation. You have a different purpose. You have a different process of work. You have arrivals versus departures. You have continuance rather than transition. There's lots of demands. A night auditor, the criteria for a night auditor is radically different than everybody else. They have to be able to be awake at a time when most people are asleep. They have to be able to do functional work repetitively similarly day in and day out that would normally drive other people like i need something different no, no, no night audit is very much not different very night audit is progressive and, and process based 
But by the same token, they have to be prepared for variations because some crazy stuff happens during night audit. <laughs> Things that don't happen during the day happen during night audit. And all of those nuances aren't really conveyed as well as they need to be to the person responsible for finding a position role, HR. They, they, they're being given the classification, I need this much education, this much work experience, any relative uh, information associated with this, blah, blah, blah. And that's the checkboxes that the HR will go and chase after. And But we've talked about it before. It never flipped over to say, and what do we give to get this? What What is it that we're offering the people to be interested in this role? You know, yeah. uh, and that's where you talk about the things about goal centric and, and, and what is it that it benefits you and what are your goals and what, how you want to be treated and what is, what is your culture that you're participating in and so forth. So, yes. And people want to uh, have a self-expression, uh, creative. They want to feel creatively expressed. They want to feel part of a winning team. Uh, all of those uh, fit into the laws of our human needs as well. You know, I just put in uh, a link to the article in, in Hotel Recovery where Jason Freed, who's great, uh, uh, interviewed uh, Michael Levy from Citizen M Hotel, and he's great. And, you know, he talks about the reversed pyramid where the line staff employees are at the top and the leadership is on the bottom supporting them. They have, the line staff are the ones that are responsible for, you know, making sure that they, the guest experience is great for every single guest. And if they need something to get something accomplished in order to make that happen, their, their, um, bosses are there to support them, not to dictate to them um, how to get it done, but to tell leadership what we need to get it done. And so those people surely feel great about being there because they have that being creatively expressed. They're part of the solution. They're part of, they are what brings that company up to the the highest level. And it, it actually, the whole article is very um, interesting. Actually, the last part lost me. I'll need Lauren, you to explain to me. <laughs> I'm going to go look at it now. I have not seen the article. And you're right. Jason, first... As a matter of fact, you just reminded me. I, I sent him a note because Jason has been on our show many times before as well. But it's been a while. And 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 uh, I, I want to catch up with him as to his transition for what he created Hotel Recovery for back when he had nothing to do. Uh, and literally, it was because of, okay, I got nothing to do. What can I do to be more relevant to where he has grown into where it is now and what he's transitioned to and from? Uh, and, and be just good to catch up with him. Plus also too, with the, you know, the TV channel and everything else like this is that, you know, uh, he, it could great, be a great form for him to continue on with what he does. Cause he has always been a wonderful writer in relationship to our industry. He has had many roles within our industry, uh, from a, a journalist perspective. I mean, when he was with, uh, Smith travel and so forth and what he did with, uh, Skip, uh, I mean, he's, he's written articles persistently over the years and very insightful person for someone that's not truly been working within the industry from the industry's perspective for all his life. He has a very keen perspective on the industry for all the people that he's involved in and been worked with and so forth. So yes. Um, it's great. Yeah. And it's a, it's um, a great, uh, it's a great, he has a great podcast. That's for sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, he, I mean, I, I really, I've, it's been a joy to see him grow from the, what he was like, Oh my gosh, what, you know, what am I going to do to where he's fully found his ground and, 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 and done well with it and stuff like that. Um, by no means trying to sell anything short to all this, I, I've also decided to think that rather than always try to push to where we have the limits of two hours every day, I'm like, if we're good with what we've talked about, we're good for the day. But by the same token, I don't want to cut it short. If you feel that there's something you brought to the table that you want to make sure we talked about while we get, I have the pleasure of having you on the show or us being <laughs> on the show together. It's not my show. It's our show. Uh, you know, is there something that you want to make sure we did, got to talk about today that we hadn't got to from our dialogue so far? No, the only thing I, I wanted to maybe just add something to what we were talking about before, uh, okay. what Tim said about, you know, being clean and friendly. I can tell you that I have read a lot of reviews for the months of June uh, and May. And I can tell you that there are so many one star reviews saying dirty, dirty, mm -hmm. dirty. It's 
it's terrible. Why? I mean, let's at least if we can't do anything else in the hospitality business, especially in these days, why do we still have so many complaints like this? I mean, this I, I know that this is a tough time for housekeeping, but I mean, that is our baseline that we, we shouldn't, if we don't have time to do that, we shouldn't let anybody into the room. It's, it just, it, it, it just broke my heart. It's, un, it's unfortunate, but I think uh, our industry is turning into a mirror of our society in some ways. And that is if we can blame something, it's at least not us. Mm -hmm. um, we go to a restaurant now and the first thing from the server isn't the joy of seeing us. And I'm being very general. Not all places are like this and not all hotels are the way you describe them. I mean, it's, but there is a, a growing size to this number where uh, the restaurant's first words are, we're sorry, we're limited in service or we don't have a full staff or whatever the rationale of what you're about to experience is probably not what we would like you to have or what we used to have or what we can, what you think you should have. Just take what you can get is the premise of that kind of statement, okay? We don't have the people that we normally have. We don't have the capacity we used to have. We don't have the service level we have, whatever it is. It certainly does not reflect in the price. Price is you better have, you know, pay this for what we were lucky to have given you is the attitude that the, our industry is giving right now. This is our rate. Terribly sorry, but hey, you know, the pandemic. And as long as we can push it to some other, deflect the anger to some other cause, like it's not us. Hey, we'd love to do better, but we can't. I think a lot of it is they won't. Rather, because here's my rationale with this. Instead of, doing the business that you can provide that level of service that you would want to give the guest, you're instead taking their money for what you can give the guest. And, and so they're selling past their service levels. I keep saying this over for a hotel's perspective. They're doing the same in restaurants and they're marginalizing what they're selling, but premium pricing what they're giving. Uh, what's Rich to say? Because we're greedy, exactly. Too few associates talk. They'll want to be occupied by service and claims both suffer. Completely agree with you, Richard. It's, it, and, and, and to Ed's point earlier on, the companies that are most reflective of that mindset are REITs. They're the ones that are just driven by profit and margins of investment than they are about hospitality and service scores. And I think also was pointed out in the earlier conversation, Richard, and I don't know if that happened before you joined us. Um, it's because brands aren't pushing back hard on them either because there's too much of a relationship with them. They can't push back on a higher portfolio ownership. And Honestly, brands have no ground to stand on because they've been so bad at this process. Uh, and, and whether you want to blame them for being structurally in, inefficient on this or not, I blame them for a lack of adaptability and I blame them for responsiveness. And I blame them for their re reaction to what they did by how they furloughed and how they diminished their service abilities by cost savings first and then let's evaluate it after we've cut our costs. I think that a lot of companies that are doing well now, and this has been pointed out persistently, both Adele and the numbers you've talked about, and in business, the hotels that didn't furlough their people are not having a problem. The people that the companies that took care of their people during the downturn are not having the same scale of problems. Not saying they don't have problems, but they're not having the same scale of problems. And the same places that maintained their integrity through the, the pandemic as it does ongoing are not having the same service issues either. It's the hotels and the businesses that did respond the way we're talking that are now trying to rebuild and not get back to staff because the staff are saying, yeah, you know, no, we kind of see your true colors now. And and for the companies that are trying to cover their costs and above, above service, which is what we're talking about also, uh, they're the ones that are like, oh, we can't do what we say we want to do. Yeah, you know, and and I'm no, I know all hope, I'm not all businesses are fitting into these generalizations. I know there's some hotels that, are trying to get back. They had to cut people and they're good intended and they're trying to do their best. I know that there's exceptions to what I just said, but again, there's too many larger numbers that suggest that the generality of my statement is still valid, that there are businesses that are just doing that. So um, anyway, so <laughs> yes, um, uh, to that end, um, oh, golly. Uh, oh, you don't know, uh, any more podcasts coming up? You know what? I, I, I'm going to have to record something today. <laughs> no worries. I'm going to have to record something today because I didn't do any interviews this week. But so I'll have my first solo. OK. And also, <laughs> I'm soliciting open now. We're going to transition the sales podcast to being guest host driven. So I'm going to start looking for experts in the field of hospitality sales. 
uh, to become guest hosts to run the podcast uh, for whatever topics that they want to generate and bring into the podcast. Um, for consistency, I think we're doing that. I think, um, in all fairness, Holly, who had been the consistent guest host for that, uh, is just being, and we all are facing this. We're seeing this by the attendance we have for co-hosts. We're seeing this on, on uh, people are busy for a variety of reasons. And some people can and can't make it based on those demand cycles. And uh, Holly is no exception to that. She's been very busy and successfully busy with her training programs with HSMAI, uh, her and Dan Waxman together. And just she finds it a struggle to be consistent with sales podcasts. And so she's surrendered saying, hey, look, you know, if you feel that there's a way we can cycle through other co-hosts that are skilled and keep them the integrity of the sales podcast, she's all for it. So we're going to start putting out an open request for people that are skilled in sales that wish to bring up a topic under the podcast banner. For sales, all they have to do is record the podcast and review it with us as to the content. And uh, if uh, meets mustard, then we will put it in the podcast cycle. So with that in mind, speaking of podcasts, where can they find yours and you? Uh, you can find uh, my podcast at the at adelgutman.com. And then from there, you'll see uh, the Hospitality Reputation Marketing Podcast, Get Great Reviews, uh, where I usually interview people, but sometimes I'm going to be on my own just uh, sharing some, some tidbits uh, with you on how I had the number one, number two, number three, and number four hotels in a row on the top of TripAdvisor in New York uh, uh, out of hundreds of hotels, the number one hotel in the world uh, on TripAdvisor for 2017, and the highest uh, guest satisfaction of any luxury hotel brand in the world year after year, according to Review Pro. And any business, doesn't even have to be a hotel, can get great revenue boosting results by focusing on the guest experience. Uh, it drives loyalty, not only to your guests, but uh, for your employees. So it's a really important topic right now. And anybody that thinks that they're saving money by, uh, by, by cutting corners, uh, in the long run, it is not a profitable or a uh, nice way to do business. It is not going to sustain your business for the long term. So anyway, uh, yes, yeah. yeah, so you can find the Re Hospitality Reputation Marketing Podcast on uh, Audible, on Amazon, Spotify, anywhere you like. And I think we already got a uh, future co-host for sales. Richard's going to jump in, uh, which would be awesome because Richard, talk about qualified, I'd say so. Um, <laughs> uh, with that in mind, uh, and Richard, we need to talk also on the Hospitality TV channel. Strangely enough today, I, I, I think I've told you this before, Del, We, you, you know how much we simulcast everything. We're on Facebook, multiple places, Twitter, multiple places, uh, LinkedIn, one place because LinkedIn restricts that, uh, YouTube, multiple places. Uh, we're also on uh, Roku. We do the, the, the show here today. We do that live on the free side of the channel, Hospitality Channel TV. So that's on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Prime Video, and Google Play. We're also an app for uh, iOS and Android. So you can watch us on the phone. You can watch us on tablets, iPads, whatever. Um, and then we have the subscription side, which we're building content for right now. Uh, for the paid service, like Netflix, you pay four ninety nine. It's all on demand stuff. So we're getting a lot of food and beverage, and I want to make sure that's balanced because we're getting a lot of really cool food and beverage content uh, suggestions or submissions to putting it in there. I want to make sure it's balanced with other things. And I say this in front of our audience here, but also we're also on a platform called Twitch, and I don't know whether I told you, Adele. The reason why I put ourselves on Twitch is because now we broadcast on Xbox and Playstations because a lot of people use their game box for watching Netflix and watching Hulu and watching these on demand, what's called OTT TV. And so we get a live audience. And strangely enough today, we had around 60 some odd people watching us on Twitch. Now, I don't know who they are, because in all honesty, I picked the platform because of its distribution to the game station platform market. Uh, Twitch is usually related to gamers, you know, people that play games and they want to broadcast with their, while they're playing the game for other people to watch. Uh, but it's also turned into a channel like this where people share content, where they will do shows and put things on there. And so that's why I want to make sure we're there. So I'm going to go try to dig some stats up and see who these people are and why they were deciding that all of a sudden today, Twitch has high popularity. Uh, well, you know, numerics of people watching in live sense. So uh, I'll go take a look at it. Anyways, um, 
with that in mind, for everyone to know, you can uh, we'll rebroadcast this show at 11.30 a.m. Sydney and London time, as we normally do each week on Wednesdays. Uh, you can find us on all the platforms I just mentioned. We also have the Hospitality Marketing Podcast, which I'll be doing a quick recap of the show on today as well. There's the Hospitality Sales Podcast, Hospitality Meta Search Podcast, which Dean Schmidt, who said he was busy today, was not able to join the show, so Dean, we miss you. Uh, we also have the... Um, hospitality Revenue Management, which we're hoping Lily, having come back from her Mexican adventure and dealing with the family that she's dealing with, we'll hope that she gets back into her cycle of podcasts. She has been uh, very busy to produce her latest podcast for Revenue Management. But when she does, though, it is brilliant material. And all the old Revenue Management ones have been incredibly applicable because she has done them through COVID. So all those are applicable processes. So with that in mind, you can see this show at hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. But more importantly, you can see it at hospitalitychannel.tv or talktravel.tv. So Adele, with all those disclaimers and everything else, thank you so much, as always. Uh, it's a pleasure. Time. Thank you so much. We will see you next Friday. <laughs> Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks, Adele. Bye, everyone.